is holding now a uh, great invention of his. And yeah. 1984, I think, turns out to be an important year for this entire panel. <laughs> That's the year that uh, Guy got his important, not grant, but contract from the government of Canada. It's the year that Mark, and correct me if I'm mistaken here, read about how syringes were being reused and that was spreading HIV. Uh, one of those heart-wrenching stories that we often read, uh, but unlike most of us, uh, when Mark read this, he decided to change his life and do something about it, and that's what he's been doing ever since. Uh, both uh, founding a company which produces syringes that can't be reused, and also an NGO that spreads awareness of it. Sitting next to him is Sifo Moyo. I'm so glad that Sifo is here because so often, I think a lot of our discussion is going to be about Africa, and so often uh, I moderate panels, uh, especially at conferences like this, uh, where Western people talk a lot about the problems of Africa in very wise ways and nod our heads. So it's good to have at least one actual African here. Sifo has 18 years of experience in development in Africa. She's worked all over the continent, <coughs> Tanzania most recently, Nigeria. She's in Johannesburg now. And uh, she emphasized to me that she is not Dambisa <coughs> Moyo, uh, although she has some controversial and sharp views herself. And her father, did teach Dambisa and their friends. So Dambisa's father taught Dambisa's me. Dambisa's father taught her. Yeah. So uh, we have connections <laughs> here. And then, of course, um, famous to everyone who lives in Britain, uh, Dame Barbara Stocking. I feel I should curtsy when no, we No, no, could you stop you. saying Dame? It doesn't sort of go with Oxfam somehow, so <laughs> we'll just uh, drop that one. <laughs> who is the CEO of Oxfam uh, Great Britain. Um, this is one of the world's most admired uh, and accomplished philanthropies. Uh, four and a half thousand employees, a budget of 300 million pounds, doing huge and really important work around the world. And it's some really important, making some really important connections that we'll talk about, uh, I hope, on this panel, um, about connecting the dots between what businesses do in their business and how they can make the world a better place, a little bit what we've been talking about with Guy. So how we're going to organize this panel is I'm going to ask our brilliant panelists questions for about 15 minutes. I hope they'll all jump in and very <coughs> kindly but forcefully uh, disagree with one another where they have reason to. Uh, then uh, uh, we will have about 15 or 20 minutes for questions, and we will end promptly at 5 o'clock. I promise you, dear zeitgeisters. Um, so starting with Mark, um, talk to us um, a little bit, Mark, about, I mean, the idea seems so obvious um, that syringes which are reused can spread disease. Um, and yet you have found, found it far from obvious and far from easy to actually have these non-reusable syringes be the ones that are being used. So, so why is it so hard? What are the obstacles? Oh, I wish I knew. Um, when I started in 1984, I thought I'll come up with a design. Two years later, I'll be I'll go travelling. You know, but um, it actually has. Uh, and, and tell us about, describe the design briefly. Well, it, it's still a big problem. Basically, uh, for the audience, um, the, a normal syringe can be reused because it's just a plastic barrel with a plunger in it. Uh, what I designed after three years of research is this product. Um, it looks like a normal syringe. And after use um, in the patient, it's discarded. If someone then tries to pick it up and refill it, um, the action of pulling back the plunger makes it lock and break and uh, it can't be used again. And the key to this was that it's made on existing equipment uh, in the manufacturing systems that exist. There are about 600 factories in the world. So what I wanted to do was come up with a design which didn't force any change or extra cost to manufacturers, can be used in the same way, and, um, and costs exactly the same um, as a normal syringe. Thank you. Now, if you doubt the importance of these syringes, I urge you during the breaks uh, to accost Mark and ask him to show you, play you a video on his phone. I'm afraid it's not an Android, it's actually an iPhone. <laughs> uh, uh, of uh, some scenes that you've taken, uh, sort of covert scenes you've taken inside clinics. Can you describe yeah. what's well, in Well, it's, it's still going on. You know, today, um, something like 60% of all injections given in India are unsafe. The same system or the same numbers are apparent in most developing world countries. 
Um, and it's not really clear. There's not one particular so reason. So people going in to get immunizations for their babies. Immunizations are, are not too bad if they're UN run or if they're NGO run because there's a mandate for immunizations to be given with these safe syringes. But that, those only represent a very small percentage. The vast majority of injections um, are not in any way safe um, if they don't use this or they don't use correct procedure. And so we end up with something like 1.3 million deaths, World Health Organization number, <coughs> being caused every single year, which is twice the amount of uh, the death toll of malaria, even. And what, what angers me is this is caused by a doctor or a nurse. This isn't uh, you know, an innocent m uh, mosquito. This is actually being transmitted to the patients uh, via a healthcare worker. Do you find government bureaucracies an obstacle? Yes. <laughs> How and why? Um, there, there's a lot of corruption. There's a lot of bribery. There's, a, you know, there are more at the moment. There are more normal syringe manufacturers in the world than there are safety syringe manufacturers in the world. And they seem to win. I don't know how that it works out, but they seem to uh, keep the status quo going where they're supplying, you know, sometimes unsterile products, but they're in a package, so they look sterile. Um, and they're, they're coming in at very, very under, underpriced levels, so they're just flooding the market with these products. And it is particularly dangerous because syringes are the most commonly used piece of medical equipment in the world. So if you've got a base where uh, disease is being spread from the actual most commonly used medical product in the world, that, that's pretty perverse. Um, now, Mark, if I were an African health minister and you came to sing the virtues of your syringe, I might say to you, but come on, you're selling me this stuff. Uh, aren't you just trying to make lots of money? So um, what's your comeback? Well, that, that, is, that is obviously true. I, I do run a company and, I do, and we license these to 13 manufacturers now around the world and make a couple of million of these units a day. Um, but uh, it, it is absolutely true. And I think whether I directly profit or not, I'm not really don't really have time to defend. What I want to do is change the scene quite dramatically. I want to um, see if I can put into action an idea that I've got where we open source good ideas, where good ideas are no longer constrained under commercial reality. And, and to the audience, you, you'll think I'm mad because obviously you live in the commercial world where it's dog eat dog and, and every margin counts. But actually, regardless they're of... They're muzzled. Yeah. It's a but regardless so of what I might profit out of this product, it really doesn't matter. What matters is that this reaches its humanitarian scale and it does its job and we, we eradicate that 1.3 million. So Mark, I, I think you're, you're trying to think about ways to get around this potential conflict where you're selling a solution, but you also run a company that wants to make money. How, how, how can you square that circle? Um, well, the idea that I'm working on at the moment is that, that uh, we kind of eradicate the company angle. And we try and uh, transfer Shut down it, your company? Shut down the company um, selectively. And I use that word very advisedly because this isn't a launch of, of the idea. This is just a con conceptual description of the idea. Um, the idea would be that we somehow shut down the company and we pass over the designs um, to, uh, to an open sourcing system where we... You're going to go Google? We go Google. We allow everyone to manufacture the product. Um, and as long as they meet constraints of quality um, and targets of, of production, that you know, somehow we reward them with, with an open source type um, uh, royalty rebate or, or something along those lines. So, and, and how will that make you more effective, do you think? Well, I, I think it takes away, one, the, the, the elephant in the room, the one that you mentioned of, is he making money out of it? Um, but also, it allows me to be much more vocal and hold a gun to these ministers' heads. So if you I were a minister, I'm going to say, change or you're part of the problem. You know? and, and how, I mean, you have to live, right? So how can you take the financial element out of the equation? Do you need a sugar daddy to come in? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're looking at exactly that. And sugar daddies, let's, let's face it, um, normally set up funds. Um, and their ultimate reward is to save a life or to improve a life. And, it, and if, uh, you know, if the dialogue goes along, look, if you gave me X million dollars and I could save X million lives, would you be willing to do it? 
Um, you know, I think there are plenty out there that want that. And, and I think it only works with certain products. They've got to be pretty well developed. They've got to have proven uh, that they deserve a place in, in the world and that they can uh, be scaled and be just as effective um, scaled w without any detriment. And I, I, I feel this is a no-brainer because we've got a market already out there. We've got a manufacturing system out there already, and they're just making almost this product, but not quite. And, and the changeover is pretty easy.